Talk Recorded live. Please help me welcome Al Borowski to the Comcast Spotlight Sales Drive CD. Al began his career selling nouns and pronouns to 7th graders. He then moved into selling data processing filing systems and work environments. He moved on from selling to becoming a branch manager, an area sales manager, a business development manager, and a customer service manager. For the last 24 years, Al has used his selling and proposal writing skills to build a very successful speaking and training business. Al has written two books and more than 50 articles on business writing and communication skills. Today, he will share with us his three keys to successful proposal writing. Welcome, Al. Thank you, Rebecca. I'm delighted to be here with you. Tell us, what is your first key? Well, the first key in writing a proposal is to avoid boilerplate pollution. Now, what that really means is you need to focus on the client's needs, not what your brochures or websites say. Too many salespeople and marketing people and proposal writers focus on what their company or their products or their services can do. They don't focus specifically on what they can do for the specific client. Now, you can spot boilerplate pollution very simply. If the words and the pictures and the illustrations and the descriptions you find in your proposal repeat the words, pictures, illustrations, and descriptions you find in your brochures or your website, you're experiencing boilerplate pollution. That means your proposal is focusing on your company, not the client. So the first tip really is read your proposal, then read your brochures and website, and if you sound like you're repeating yourself, you need to do some editing or some rewriting of your proposal. I love that word pollution because really there's no value there to the client because it's not about them, it's all about us, and so in essence it's just pollution. Exactly. That's wonderful. And what's your second key? The second key is to be real. Now, being real to me also means being clear. Being real means being the person that showed up in that client's office or that talked to the person on the telephone. And what it means is that you have to be clear every time so that you don't appear to be somebody different when they get your proposal. Let me give you a couple of examples of how all of this happens. Your proposal must clearly show that you know, understand, and can address your client's needs. Your solution should leave no doubt in their minds that you have their best interests in mind. And it shows that you understand their situation, their budgets, their expectations, the goals of the project, and even their timetable. So you have to really be you. And the, the way you be you is that the same person shows up on paper as showed up to talk to them about their situation. Secondly, you have to be clear with the solution to their problem. And you can clearly explain what the client's world will look like after accepting your proposal. So you really have to be clear there. And you have to be clear on why your product or your service stands out as the most logical choice. See, your proposal should prove to your clients that they, that they made a great decision by selecting you. And fourth, the language and the words and the tone of your document must be clear. And again, this is part of being the real you. For example, let, let me give you two sentences, and you can compare the language and the tone and, and the words. Sentence number one, the contract stipulates exacting specifications for the installation of eight vertical access devices. This is the way we wrote when we were sophomores in college. The way people really mean that is the contract calls for the installation of eight elevators. See, in high school and in college, when we wrote our term papers, we filled them with polysyllabic words to impress our teachers. Today, we tend to use consultant words like utilize and paradigm and reiterate and conundrum and initiative and, and transpire. These are horrible words to use in a proposal, or even in, in, in really in any business document. And I have a lot of reasons for that, and I'd be delighted to share that at another time. But here's the general rule there. If your clients don't use those words, you don't use those words. What you have to be able to do is to mirror 
their situation, their problem, what they're trying to achieve, not try to impress them with your vocabulary. That's really a good point, Al, because in our business we have our own terms, and in every industry really has their own terms as well, and you really have to, to judge your client as to what terms you can use in front of them, or just forget it, don't, don't use those kinds of words. We, we, it's like we talk another language in front of our clients sometimes. Sure, and, and we tend to do it even more in writing. Right. We tend to be very conversational when we're with our clients, either in person or on the phone. But for some reason, we turn into this other person that uses strange words, and it really doesn't work for proposals. It like, almost has like a little bit of a disconnect, and therefore almost probably is a trust breaker because they're like, what's this document they're giving me that has all these big words on it when that's not who you are in person to them? You took the words right out of my mouth when you said trust because who is this person that is showing up on paper? It's not the same person I met in person. Right. Very good. So what's your third key? Okay, the third key is to understand what RFP really means so that you don't waste time. A lot of people assume that they know what RFP means by taking RFP to mean request for proposal. That may be true in some instances, but we have some other things that RFP can mean, and if you mistake this for a request for a proposal, you're going to be wasting your time. One of them is RFP meaning request for pricing. See, many times salespeople confuse these two terms. Request for pricing simply means that the company is comparison shopping. They might not even be ready, willing, or able to place an order. The salespeople who mistake this as a proposal opportunity waste their time, they waste their effort, and they waste a lot of information. Send the price quote. Send the bid response. Send something. Or maybe do nothing. See, whatever you do, don't spend time creating a proposal when your chances of receiving the order or contract are limited. Now, that's one definition for RFP, request for pricing. Another is request for positioning. Many times prospect will ask for a proposal to determine if the company they plan to award the order to is actually giving them the best price. And they will use your information to justify their decision to go with someone else. So all they're doing is positioning their favorite company against you. And the third Time. And I, I see this most often, I'm guessing, in, in uh, inexperienced salespeople. RFP meaning required for put off. And sometimes the prospects do this as a ploy to limit your access to them. This can mean many things. It could mean that they already plan to use a preferred vendor, uh, or they know little about your company, or they've received bad, uh, although unfounded reviews of your organization. They may have also had a bad experience with the previous salesperson or principal from your company. So the reasons can be endless, but what they're trying to do is to put you off so that they can make a, a fair decision down the road and also give the appearance of being fair by requesting, well, well we ask them to send a proposal. So you have to be aware of that. And again, after all, strange things can happen during and after the process of vendor selection. And they might even be compelled to use someone else or to use you as a last resort. So be, be weary of if or when you send proposals. Make sure you're not wasting your time. Make sure you have a pretty good chance of getting that proposal. That's interesting. I think in our case sometimes I like that last one because I think clients may sometimes say to us, oh, yeah, okay, you can put something together for me. You can show me something. But unless right. they've given you something really specific about their business, some sort of marketing need that they have that you can put something together on, you're really throwing a dart at the wall because you don't know what you're trying to solve with this advertising campaign. So sometimes I will say to them, well, how interested are you really? Are you interested enough to give me a very specific situation that I could work on? So give me an upcoming sale that you're having, or give me a marketing challenge that you have, and let me show you what I could do with that specific thing versus just generically, yes, send me something, show me, show me generically what it might cost. Exactly. The, the more information you have about the client, 
uh, about what they need, what they want, how they feel, what their experiences have been. The more you can match their goals and their dreams and their expectations, the better off you are. And if you don't know that stuff, you're wasting a lot of time. Well, that's great stuff. Excellent. Well, thank you, and thank you for joining our Sales Drive CD. I'm delighted to be with you. 